you're stellar learning in space. Now I don't read well, so of course I'm going to deviate from my slide from my notes, right? But um, this is a vision of interstellar. When we first walked through the portal, this is what we saw. What a breathtaking build, but the story does not begin here. Now I'm going to turn the floor over to Andy Stricker in just a moment, but first I'm going to introduce them. I know Buffy gave us a little introduction, but Andy is an instructional architect with the Air University, and he's our mastermind for these activities. Let me go ahead and show you. A, that's a bio slide too, right? Now, if you have trouble seeing the slides, hold down your Alt key and scroll, scroll in. Click on the slide presentation and then just scroll on in so you can see it comfortably. Andy served for 27 years as an Air Force officer. He also taught at Oxford for the Summer Institute. He taught quantum mechanics and intelligent agents. So he's really a, a marvelous individual who's an expert at cognitive psychology, at instructional design, and he scripts and he designs mesh. <laughs> JJ Drinkwater, she's in the audience, but uh, JJ Drinkwater is the librarian of Caledon. And Mr. Drinkwater is our inspiration at Virtual Harmony and, and of course in charge of our sci-fi library. And I met Mr. Drinkwater when we were together in the Lovers of Literacy group here in Second Life through Caledon, those wonderful book readings. Now I apologize, Barbara, if you gave me a different bio. I whipped up a quick one about her because, you know, I was Barbara's mentor in college when she was, um, getting her doctoral degree and she inspired me so much that we uh, we have continued to work together and we are amazing collaborators. She's at the University of Central Florida. She too is an incredible, not just an instructional architect, but she's a connectivist and she's all about appreciative inquiry and so many different ways of connecting scientists and, and people to help address really wicked problems like addressing cancer. And then I'm Cynthia Colloin, better known as Lear Lobo. I'm a professor with CTU Doctoral Studies. I teach at three schools these days because I'm an adjunct. And of course, today's the last day of classes. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm a crazy woman, right? But I'm education chair of the Nonprofit Commons, and we'd like to invite you to join us. We welcome educators, we welcome nonprofits, we, wel we welcome everyone, frankly. And we offer free technology education on Friday mornings, tours in Second Life. Yo, Frankie. And see, I met Frankie and Barbara at Defense Game Tech in 2010, I think it was. And that's where I met J.B. Hancock, Han Hancroft earlier, who spoke about um, scripting and memory in LSL. So I want to do a shout out to all these people. We're all connected in such amazing ways. Well, yeah, I teach, I conduct research, I play games, I play World of Warcraft in a big way. And then, of course, I, I like to design games and simulations. And I like to think about how we learn through them. Okay, I, I, I put up slide numbers so I could remember to flip my own slides, right? <laughs> Here we are sitting in the Simone de Beauvoir Salon at Virtual Harmony. But the story doesn't start here, but I wanted to show this image because this is how we spend our Sundays. You know how most people have a life on Sundays? And I mean, this is Sunday afternoons after all the things we do, of course, to honor uh, our families in that day. We get together and we think about how to make learning a more compelling experience through these virtual, virtual immersive technologies. Yeah, you bet, Frankie. <laughs> oh, I better keep clicking, huh? And then, of course, many of us come from, well, it's Barbara, um, Andy and I went to high school and college together, and we grew up near New Harmony, Indiana. And, and Andy, I haven't given you a chance to say a word in edgewise, so this is your opportunity to chime in. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was, that was an awesome way to get us going. Thank you, Lear. As she was was sharing, uh, we come from this utopian community called New Harmony, and it's, uh, you know, in early American history, you know, people came uh, really believing that they could create a, a new uh, life that was based on ways that uh, people could help each other, and, and, and they really believed in education, and some of the first uh, public co-educational schools were created in New, new Harmony, and 
and eventually it became a scientific community. And so uh, the Smithsonian Institution in DC was based off of a laboratory in New Harmony. So we have quite a history of innovation and entrepreneurship, <laughs> which uh, I guess uh, uh, it's carried forward in the generation since. I go to you, Lear. See, I had a feeling he was going to say that. So notice how I typed it before I even said it. We didn't coordinate our talk, by the way. We have we have given so many talks. This is my 300th, you know, that it's kind of like we can start a sentence and then he finishes it or something. <laughs> and and I love that level of symmetry. So Barbara joined our group. We met her at Defense Game Tech when we met Frankie at the very same time. Hi, Frankie, and and with with Larry Johnson of the New Media Consortium. Right. So if you're thinking about the Horizon Report, and I need to type that because you know, we do have folks who cannot hear. So please help me out here if you. Um, so we all met through this wonderful uh, collection of thought. Right. And Frankie had just finished her dissertation and Barbara had, had done all her doctoral work, but then switched schools and started over with me. What an amazing thing. Right. So here we are. We're sitting in sick bay, and all of us are there, and so are our fellow students. They're presenting their homework, their final project, right? And they, one group designed a spaceship with all these space games on board, and it was just breathtaking. They used the uh, Star War, uh, Star Trek um, L Cars um, database for the images. So it looks very authentic, and that's, this was all custom design, except for perhaps the body on the on the gurney. <laughs> So let's get off to space. We have to get back to Interstellar. So here we are, and JJ Drinkwater is sitting in the cockpit. And you know, the day we did this, I showed up and I didn't have time to read my email. And every week there's something new, something marvelous, right? And so, of course, I um, get to the next slide. You can see the dashboard here. You can see all these buttons, and you're probably thinking, well, how do you know what to push? And see, that's the point of this. And Andy, I'm going to turn it back over to you. And I have two more slides that illustrate some more of this. But why don't you go ahead and tell us about the design of the cockpit? Well, thank you. Well, one of the things that we wanted to do was create these scenarios that were very interactive and bring a little bit of a mystery uh, where you have to get clues and figure out uh, what the purpose of these uh, vehicles and instruments are. And so everything we've done over the past several years has been in the form of an expedition where you have to take a hero's journey and, and travel to solve a mystery. And so we teach STEM and, and in many cases uh, STEAM because they blend a lot of the STEM and STEAM areas together in, in our work. So here in this particular bucket, uh, you have to put in the um, coordinates and get the systems turned on. And so uh, you go through a sequence in which you prepare the rocket for uh, destination to the International Space Station that we have. Over back to you. Thank you. Well, JJ sitting in the cockpit and I have locked my camera onto JJ. Okay. So I'm on the ground. I'm in the flight control room where instructors would be. And this is a student taking off. JJ's in the role. We're testing it. Right. You see all these controls here. I double expose the image and I'm so sorry. I can't type this. Uh, I double expose the image. Right. And uh, so, so the upper one is how it might look before all is well, right? <laughs> Until you're ready to launch. And you have to turn the knobs and flip the switches and you see them all there. Just scroll in close because let me tell you, it was enough to make my eyes glaze over because you can't just flip them all on. They have to go on in a certain order. <laughs> so um, let me go back to this. Did you want to say anything else about that, Andy? Yeah, we we um, have a lot of way too much fun with designing these things, <laughs> but uh, uh, we're trying to reach a very broad uh, age range and backgrounds. And so, what's what we try to do with all of our simulation work is adjust it so that it has appeal to junior high, high school, college, and in many cases, uh, 
graduate level students. And so we, we try to uh, create these simulations, have a lot of flexibility, and, and so we're instructors, facilitators can adapt them for, you know, individual use as well as group teamwork too. So we've docked at the space station and I'll show you an image of the space station later in the slides. And it, when we first dock, we take a few steps and this is what we see. And I'm sit, sitting there looking up, um, trying to figure out, do I want to go down to the crew com commons module or do I want to go down towards the deep space explorer? Do I want to go to the crew areas where uh, people can set up apartments, right? Over to you, Andy. So this work builds off of an earlier simulation, it actually has this genesis in the second live, um, the Mars uh, simulation that NASA and JPL and the Air Force and Colorado Tech and, and uh, the University of Central Florida helped uh, put together and so, uh, We've continued to evolve this simulation over the years, <laughs> and it's really become um, quite fun because, uh, as you'll hear about here soon, uh, we go beyond Mars now. <laughs> yeah, every time um, the news, the media, the technology, the scientists, everyone gets excited about something. Like right now, the excitement is about Mars. We start thinking beyond it, right? <laughs> we we never really uh, stop. And that's what makes this so wonderful. It keeps evolving. And here's the crew commons. And inside the left path, you can see us all sitting around the table thinking about our next steps. Andy is, I took a few images of us and Andy kindly put those in some of the windows. It looks like we're peering in on ourselves, right? But it gives us this wonderful way to think about what should we do next? What would a user unfamiliar with this do, right? With this technology, where would they go and how would they solve the next problem? So now we head on down the right hallway and we see Inside a console, there's this system, and I, I'm actually going to pull up the next slide to go into that. It, we call it the Red Queen, and I'm not really giving a great image of it here, Andy, because I know you're going to feature it on Saturday to a certain extent. So, uh, do, is there anything you want to say about the Red Queen? Well, that's been a really fun thing. Uh, we we got um, some source code from MIT. Uh, for a, an AI engine, so we plugged it in. So we have a little bit of fun with uh, a system that uh, it takes your natural uh, language input and analyzes it um, using a semantic tool and comes back with various constructs on the types of topic areas that uh, at that particular point in the simulation, the expedition journey, uh, it's pointing um, to see if you understand those constructs. And so it gives you feedback and recommendations. And we've had way, way too much fun with that too. Um, and we've also integrated Unity into the simulation. So there's a Unity engine that supports the, uh, the interactivity with the Mars network. So you interact with people through the Mars network to pick up clues uh, as you journey towards Mars. And here we are at space dock, right? Uh, excuse me, at the um, the space station. We're about to take off, and I'm the kind of person who always sends my camera outside the uh, the spacecraft and has to know where have we where have we been, where are we going, and how does it look from so many different perspectives. And he built all this. That's what's incredible. This wasn't. We didn't go shopping. We have this in open sim. Okay, so we're talking about an open source world, and I know educators are always saying, oh, this takes way too much effort, right? And it's possible it does, but Andy has no life. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> Actually, he does. He has a farm, and he takes care of the farm family after our meetings. So, um, and Andy, if you want to chime in in any of these, just let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to get us to Mars and then turn it back over to you. So here we are, the quest for Blue Mars, and this was our talk last year here at BWBPE, but we've gone beyond this. So, of course, uh, we're thinking about that. We're heading to the next area. And our goal, the reason we call it Blue Mars, is to make Mars breathable, habitable, right? Which, of course, is not possible. And I know scientists say, and, and many of you in the audience are probably saying, never happened. But let's face it. 
if you never dream and you've never stretched yourself to try new things and to rethink what we know, you know, you never get there, right? So here we are. Um, you see us landing, getting ready to explore Mars Station. I have also pulled my camera down into the planet. So you, I'm giving you a little peek at what lies beneath, okay? <laughs> So I remember I'm the kind of person who has to know what's behind the corner, you know, what's in the closet, you know, what's going on. So here we are. I changed the lighting to give a better sense of the red planet and the equipment around us because I had the lighting set to a midnight, right? So that the space, uh, the feeling of space through the simulation is more authentic. But I don't want everything to be midnight when I land, right? I want the, the atmosphere to be midnight, but not the ground. Andy designed all of this mesh and scripted it. Andy, do you want to tell, tell us about what we're seeing here on scene? Well, one of the things that uh, I do want to say briefly is um, JJ that uh, Lear mentioned earlier has been absolutely fantastic in creating a rich uh, source of information about the connection of science fiction related to science. You know, how do we, how do we imagine uh, the possibilities there are the possible and plan for the future. So JJ has put together a wonderful set of resources around the science fiction author that we uh, admire that uh, we highlight quite a bit in our work called Robert Heinlein. So what you see here is, is you know, imagination at work. So when people come through the simulation, we kind of like to blend the science with these elements of um, you know the possible, possible, and so they have a chance to kind of, uh, you know, you know, really have a little bit of fun with uh, the the effort that they're undergoing in the simulation, and and then learn about so many different things uh, in addition to uh, the science or learning about um, a variety of science fiction authors and and how important it is to science. Thank you, Andy. So let's see where we're at. Hey, we're headed to the red planet. And of course, I changed my lighting again. If you have never changed, used the world menu and the environment editor to change your lighting, I recommend that you do because you can have so many different experiences. And I'm always on the quest to figure out where should we set our default wind light or whatever lighting set settings we're using in whatever world we're in, right? So it is mysterious on Mars. And you know, without a guide, how would you know what to do, where to go, what to touch? And we do have some perils. I didn't mention them here on the note card, but you might stop breathing, you know? <laughs> so, because let's face it, Mars is not a breathable planet. So uh, these are things to be thinking about. So Andy, I did show a little peek, but I didn't disclose any secrets. I'm just showing that uh, similar to the model you're going to show on Saturday, where you talk about the six levels, I'm showing a little cutaway into the planet's catacombs, right? And the secret areas that are important, you know, to accomplishing your mission. I don't want to give it away, you know, <laughs> in case anyone decides they want to come out and try this with us. We will need people to help us test it because when we test it, we already have some influences, right? And so expectations. Andy, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Why did we step through a stargate to get to interstellar? One of the things that uh, the simulation as it's evolved over time is we, we gradually introduce um, the realm of, you know, in, the imagination as you journey uh, through the, uh, the parts of the simulation. So eventually, as you uh, just explore your way through the Mars station, you discover the Mars caverns. <laughs> and so, so at this point, uh, things can get a bit uh, wild uh, as you go into the caverns and uh, you, then you discover uh, in your, uh, you know, journey that uh, there is a, uh, a very secret lab that's inside the cavern that's actually looking at uh, artifacts that have been discovered. And from there, it gets even uh, crazier. You uh, you begin to actually look at a model that is being examined with some lab equipment, and the model is a bit of a mystery. I'll just share enough 
uh, to say that um, the model actually comes from JPL, <laughs> uh, from a lot of research about uh, the universe. And so all the way through this, even though it seems far-fetched, uh, things that you're seeing and participating in and exploring, a lot of it is grounded in science. And so, um, and then eventually uh, we, we, we bring in a lot of common uh, scientific uh, and, and, and science fiction uh, themes related to, uh, you know, the origins of the universe and uh, interstellar travel. And so eventually we have a lot of fun, you know, who, who cannot resist, right, the temptation to have a Stargate? <laughs> so we have one of those. <laughs> And, but what we do is, is you learn about the various constellations associated with the concept of, of you know, stargates. And so, um, so, you know, in addition to the fun, we, we try to teach science as well. So let's see, we've landed at Interstellar. It's one of our latest grids. Now, here's the interesting part. For anyone who's worked in Open Simulator, and I don't know how many people have, but um, we're not just running regions. We're running at least seven grids, not all at the same time. I think we run four at a time. But Andy, you want to tell us about that? What what benefit that gave us? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, we um, we try to keep things modular so that we can combine our resources and capabilities. And so, uh, one of the things that's really helped us to do that is we have a a really good data architecture that sits behind all the grids and also with our neural net that we run and our Unity applications. And they all use the same data sources, which is very, very nice uh, because we can track um, an individual's progress uh, across multiple levels of applications and grid participations. And we have dashboards that are web uh, interfaced so we have participant dashboards, uh, instructor facilitator dashboards, and just a wealth of data. And so that helps us to really make things pretty exciting for people to participate in, in what we do. And it also gives us a lot of statistical data, you know, for research. So we've written quite a few papers, and, and at this point, I think it's two books, or maybe it's been three well, multiple chapters anyway, but two full books <laughs> about a lot of the work. So we're working on a current book. And, and then, of course, there was one, there was a book chapter I wrote for an Oxford collaboration that we haven't published. I still have to do the final housekeeping, right? The giving permission. <laughs> and so it's hard to keep track because we are so busy, but we love this. This is what makes this exciting, right? It doesn't feel like work. So Interstellar from a distance. Now I know I keep showing images of this this build, but I just was stunned when we walked through it. And of course, we tested the devices, and I I whipped around and I looked, and I saw something looming in the distance. Right, the planet rising behind us. And I have to admit, I've always had a fascination with Saturn and with the rings. I don't know about you, but you know, I've always found that to be a very magical thing, and to think of it coming so close. <laughs> It just, it, it felt like a, a wonderful place to study and to think about these big challenges. And of course, Barbara's research. I know Barbara, Barbara today is unable to speak. She's having a technology, but we are fans of the expanse. That's right. And then um, she, um, she has been working with transdisciplinarity and I'll mention that word later, but think of it as the intersection of everything, you know, of every, every topic and bridging people and connecting across boundaries and rethinking how we solve problems, right? You know, right now, I, I was I was determined not to mention coronavirus much, right? But you could play Fold It right now. How many of you know what Fold It is? Give me a yes or a no. I'm not good with this big easy business. Okay, good. We have a couple yeses. Green Shelly, you're good, good. And Buffy, I know you know because I'm always talking about it. <laughs> Out of the University of Washington, right? You today, if you had a little bit of spare time, you could go set up an account, grab a little piece of a puzzle. Grab a piece of a puzzle and work on it. 
And if you didn't want to solve it, and it's just that you just keep tinkering with it, but what you're doing is helping to contribute to solve the coronavirus puzzle. They're already on the third puzzle for coronavirus. And you may think to yourself, well, why would this matter, right? Well, I don't know if you recall, but it was either 2010 or 2011. Let's say 2011, because my, my memory of dates, you know what I mean? Um, gamers, the, the reports were gamers in two to three weeks solve the HIV protease. Did you hear about this? In those two to three weeks, and scientists worked on it, uh-huh, uh-huh, for 10 years. Okay, so how could gamers do that? Well, if you think about it, they don't know their boundaries. And they're only taking a little piece of the puzzle, and they don't have to have prior domain knowledge. So they don't have to, they're working outside the box. They're just working on a little bit of puzzle, right? Now, if you're not the kind of person who likes puzzles, right, then you could donate cycle times, a little processing time while you're asleep. That's like SETI at home. Remember SETI at home? Back in the old days when we would donate uh, a little uh, processing power? Yeah. So you might ask yourself, what can I do to help address this global problem that we're all suffering under and help make a difference? This is one way you could do it. And this is what we mean by transdisciplinarity, right? I want to type that word. I do show you later, but let's face it, now's the time, right? <laughs> and, um, and that's really what Barbara's research is about, is this connection of people across all kinds of boundaries and backgrounds who come together to tackle really wicked problems. And so this technology, visit foldit.com. That's literally the, uh, it's not, there's no .com, it's just fold.it, excuse me. It's not Italy. It's, it's out of University of Washington and you could search for it if someone has a link or something. But anyway, it's a wonderful way and they encourage ages seven through, you know, the max to participate. So we're not talking about, you know, you have to be, a chemist or a biologist or a geneticist. No, no, no. <laughs> you could be seven and participate. I think they do ask for a disclaimer for folks under 13 to make sure parents have given permission. But there we are. Well, I'll continue back with the talk, but I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, Delightful's work, and Delightful Duangle is Barbara Truman, by the way, for those of you new to our group. Spinoza Quinnell is Andy Stricker, and of course, I'm Blair Lobo and JJ Drinkwater. But um, here we go. It is lovely, and I do, uh, to me, transdisciplinarity, here in the U.S., you would call it interdisciplinary, but that really is a, is a parsimonious word for a really grand concept of how each of us can be empowered, right? How we don't have to think of our boundaries and feel restricted. That's what the beauty of the Internet, of virtual worlds, of all this technology is bridging us, right? So here we are, I'll, I'll move back to the talk. That, that was my Corona moment. <laughs> so we're back from Interstellar and we're sitting here outside in the village of Loire, right? And we're relaxing and I looked up and I saw that Andy had put this amazing artwork. I love Van Gogh's work, right? And, and how it just feels all around you. Like you're having this experience through time and space. And of course, some of us have not been well the last couple of years. We've had some really great challenges in our group. And of course, when you're not feeling well, it's always hard to think about how you're going to create the next big thing, right? <laughs> but here we are playing chess and, and being quite brave in the face of surgeries and, 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 and strife and keeping our spirits up, which is really a strength-based moment. And so I just wanted to point this out, that it's not all sunshine and roses. We all have to work very hard. So to remind us ourselves, and Andy, I'm going to put it back over to you because now we're going to move into the contemplative mind and thinking about the Knights of Loire. Okay. Well, you know, we, we, we try to, um, you know, help promote growth across the entire lifespan. Uh, particularly growth at higher levels of awareness of how we're all really interconnected and and 
you know, the world is a much better place when uh, we reach out and and uh, try to do the right things and and stay connected in meaningful ways with people. And so the contemplative research that's being done out of the University of Chicago, we really track very closely uh, in terms of how does that really help you to acquire wisdom for your your, your journey in life. We also um, track transcendentalism. Um, you know, we we uh, take a lot of the early American ideals around uh, Thoreau and Emerson, and we apply that uh, in our work. Uh, so we we really want people to experience what it's like to come out in a virtual setting and experiment with new forms of connections and community. So it's, and I guess uh, that's the spirit of where we've come from, our heritage with the Harmony Society. <laughs> and so you'll notice that a lot of uh, themes that, uh, including, um, you know, this uh, this area that puts emphasis on some of the historical figures throughout history. Memoir is very special to us because it really puts focus on extraordinary women throughout history. So. Uh, when you come into this little French village, you, you get a chance to really learn a lot about um, women that you may not, um, you know, have, have ever become acquainted with at some level. So every place you go in the village, uh, there is there is a um, something that you can uh, learn about regarding, uh, you know, women that in throughout history that have made a, a big impact, um, you know, in our society. And of course, this is delightful and. I am I'm sitting there, Joan of Arc is in the background in one scene, and, and of course we're thinking through the tough times that our world's going through, and our next steps with our designs, our builds, our game simulations, everything we do, can we strengthen, not just education, but can we strengthen ourselves, right, and, and focus on wellness for, for everyone around us. Well, I went a little fast, so of course we have time to tell more stories, Andy, from this experience. This is our um, latest effort uh, associated with research that's come out of Harvard, Columbia, and Stanford on um, professional development across the lifespan. And so uh, for several years, they've worked with thousands of people in the medical profession, the law, legal profession, and profession of arms and divinity and and they looked at you know what is necessary to help promote awareness of professionals regarding their growth throughout their their practice and so uh, research you know by Donald Schoen and um, you know that had looked at you know the kinds of challenges that we have as we mature in our profession and dealing with complexity so this particular we're going to talk about some, Saturday is, you know, what can you do with these kinds of virtual environments to help people develop in their appreciation uh, for addressing the complex challenges that uh, they're inevitably going to face as a professional? Uh, how do you keep growing? And so uh, we bring this research uh, to life in, in our in our simulation. So as you as you go through them. Uh, you have the opportunity to really learn about this wonderful, wonderful series of, um, you know, uh, research efforts by these institutions spanning nearly 30 years now. And so uh, I invite you to come Saturday and, uh, and we'll talk about how we do it. We love using a variety of technologies. You've heard us say we started in Second Life, we continue to do things here, but our development, the reason it's an open source is because we're trying to bridge with so many worlds, so many different technologies, and we try to use open source as much as possible. And that's one of our goals is to set up models that are replicable by other educators and useful beyond our use of it, right? Well, I'm going to move to the the last slide here, this is featuring Delightful Dew Angle, Barbara Truman in OpenSim. And I wanted to invite everyone, if you're not used to teaching in world, I want to invite you to do so. I taught 52 classes here in Second Life and I loved it. I taught one in OpenSim and I really loved that because then I was controlling all my content. <laughs> and of course, it's an amazing experience when you can connect 
and of course, um, transform your world. This has been a fantastic conference. I want to thank everyone for joining us.